Hello everybody and welcome to the Tatiana Show. Today is May 19th and I am broadcasting to you live from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I was just here for a music industry conference so that was really fun but very, very exhausting. Um, so now I am at my friend's office. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with BTC Media, uh, the Bitcoin Magazine guys and I also own Why Bitcoin. Um, David, the owner, is a good friend of mine so they were kind enough to let me use their control room or conference room, whatever you call this. <laughs> um, today I'm really excited for the show because it's an all women show. We kicked Josh out of the room. No, I'm just kidding. We didn't kick Josh out. He's at the Prog Conference. <laughs> um, but I didn't get to go on the show with him last week and I think that we have two really wonderful guests, um, uh, both you know dealing with topics that I'm really passionate about. Um, we have Kirsten Tynan from the Fully Informed Jury Association as our first guest. And she's going to be telling us how we can empower ourselves as citizens just through the jury duty that we are dreading every single time that little notification comes. And then we're going to bring on Laura Lopez in the second half hour. And Laura has um, mixed kind of video and uh, Bitcoin 101 stuff to make it more accessible to the average person, which of course is something that I think we need more of. Um, but first, let's welcome our guest, Kirsten. Kirsten, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Great. So um, you and I met, I believe, for the first time at the Texas LP convention. We were both on a panel there uh, just last month in San Antonio. So that was was a fun uh, weekend. Perhaps you could tell people who are not familiar with you a little bit about um, FIJA, which is what you know is the faster way of saying fully informed jury association. <laughs> <laughs> um, so give folks a little bit of a background on that. Mm -hmm. So the Fully Informed Jury Association is a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to fully informing everyone of jurors' traditional legal authority, particularly since they will not be told about it in the courtroom and, in fact, in many cases, are misled or outright lied to about it in the courtroom. And that specifically is the right to vote not guilty for any reason they believe is just, even if it means setting aside the law to do so. So for instance, if a juror believes that the defendant has in fact broken the law, but that the law is unjust or unjustly applied in the case at hand, if they believe that the law is unconstitutional, if they believe that the punishment for breaking the law, should they happen to have an idea of what that punishment is, if they think that is too harsh for the severity of the offense, or if they think there are other uh, mitigating circumstances that would make enforcing an otherwise just law unjust in the case at hand, they have the power to save that person from all kinds of devastation simply by voting not guilty. Um, in all of the federal courts and 48 of our 50 states, one single person voting not guilty, even if nobody else agrees with them, can hang the jury. Um, the two states where that's an exception are Oregon and Louisiana. In those states, it takes three people to hang a jury. And um, that's an, a, a sort of a related issue, but uh, for the most part, uh, I want everyone to understand that they, by themselves, without anyone else agreeing with them, without having to convince anyone else, they can save someone's life simply by voting not guilty. Wow. That's really, really powerful. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of frustration right now because, you know, look at our presidential election. We've got Hillary and Trump, basically. Um, Bernie Sanders was just completely you know, his votes didn't count, right? They're basically handing this to Hillary, even though she's, you know, awaiting jail any minute, hopefully. Um, but, you know, the system doesn't seem to be working. There doesn't seem to be much of a check and balance. So can you maybe um, relate that back to the rights of the jury in terms of checking the, the imbalance of power in government? Mm -hmm. So, just since you brought up presidents, one of the powers that uh, presidents or governors uh, and perhaps other um, administrative uh, officials at lower levels have is veto power. So, 
even if you know a large percentage of Congress, less than two thirds, should pass a law, one person can stop it by simply vetoing it if they happen to be. Well, jurors have a similar power. Um, you'll typically hear it referred to as jury nullification. Um, another way to put it is jury veto power. Um, also, a term I really like is conscientious acquittal. But basically, you can use your not guilty vote to overrule um, a large number of laws that are uh, being passed under the auspices of some sort of representative government, but um, I think most of us understand that uh, the, the myth of representative government isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Um, but basically, we are that check. We are that final check. When you serve on a jury, you cannot be overruled. Your, your not guilty vote cannot be overruled by the judge. Uh, basically, how, how the system was set up was it was tilted in favor of liberty. It was not meant to be an even playing field, and it certainly was not meant to be a playing field such as today's tilted toward prosecution. It was supposed to be tilted in favor of liberty. When uh, human beings are involved, when we don't have perfect information, when um, we look at the world through different filters, obviously we are not going to have a perfect system. So the system is going to err. The question then becomes, are we going to err on the side of authoritarianism, incarceration, um, and, and that sort of thing? Or are we going to err on the side of not, you know, not putting people in prison? Um, and this is, kind of goes back um, actually before Blackstone, but uh, a f very famous jurist in England, William Blackstone, formulated this in such a way that his name got attached to it uh, as the Blackstone formulation. But uh, most people are probably familiar with the idea that we say that it is better to let 10 guilty people go free rather than to convict or punish one innocent person. And so the system was set up purposely um, so that the burden of proof was on the prosecution. If you are ever a criminal defendant, you have no legal obligation to prove your innocence. Uh, all of the obligation is on the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are guilty. And even if the prosecution should prove that, if your jurors decide that it would be inappropriate to punish you or unjust, they still have the final say. When a jury delivers a not guilty verdict, it cannot be overturned. Now, uh, I earlier mentioned the case where there is a hung jury. Basically, what a hung jury is, is a jury that does not come to a verdict. So, in most states, it requires a unanimous verdict. Um, to either declare someone not guilty or guilty. But um, if a jury can't come to that consensus, say it's, you know, nine to three or something like that, then uh, what happens is usually the judge will send them back to, you know, deliberate more, <laughs> uh, often in, in, in an intimidating way that encourages people to change their votes for bad reasons. But jurors don't have to change their vote, and if it does end up that they cannot come to a consensus, um, then a mistrial will be declared. And in that case, the person can be retried. However, it is far better for the defendant than a conviction. For one thing, if you are convicted and you appeal, there are only certain uh, reasons you can appeal your conviction, and you start out with a presumption of guilt rather than the former presumption of innocence that you enjoyed before. Um, also, you are probably now going to have to defend yourself from in jail or something like that. You may have lost your resources to be able to defend yourself. So it's far better for the defendant to um, have a mistrial uh, than to be declared guilty. If, if uh, the person uh, does have a mistrial, they may not be retried at all. That, that's one possibility. Uh, we saw in San Diego in the case of Tim O'Shea, who's a medical marijuana patient, um, his jury was split 
and the prosecutor uh, probably wanted to retry it, but the judge said, in the interest of justice, um, we're not going to let you harass this man any further. Um, if the person is retried, they may have the prosecution offer them a better plea bargain than they were originally offered, or if they go to trial, then there's a possibility that, you know, having seen what the prosecution's case was before, um, they can, you know, change their strategy a bit to be able to better defend themselves. So, uh, regardless of whether or not they get an outright not guilty verdict or a mistrial, they're far better off than being convicted. And um, as I mentioned, the system is tilted so that uh, it, it is, it is you know, errors on the side of the defendant. And as I mentioned, not guilty verdicts cannot be overturned by a judge. However, a guilty verdict, if the judge feels that is unjust, or was um, arrived at inappropriately, a guilty verdict can be overturned by the judge. So you can see right there, it's not meant to be a level playing field. There's definitely a um, feature built in to make it so that the defense has you know, much more leniency towards their side than the prosecution. Um, so how did we lose our way though from that because there have been some very staggering statistics that have come to my attention for example and you can you probably know these better than I do but approximately 95 percent of people um, actually end up taking a plea bargain and that as few as five percent of jury trials are ever won on the side of the defendant so you know, this obviously has caused a whole bunch of problems. The prosecutors are making the decisions. It is oftentimes the wiser decision to take the plea deal, but there is no justice being um, being administered. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so there are a few different reasons for this. Um, basically, prosecutors have turned into an almost unchecked um, uh, government um, agent who essentially can unilaterally adjudicate cases um, in the plea bargain process because the prosecutor is the one who decides what charges will be leveled and what charges will be dropped. Um, I, I want people to think of that as prosecutor nullification because it's essentially the same thing that jurors um, are often told they're not allowed to do. But prosecutors will often add on charges falsely to um, try to bully people into taking a plea bargain, so that with the with the promise of not charging those with charging them with those harsher charges, um, or they will charge them with things that they actually did, but then agree to drop certain charges, basically saying, "I will not enforce the law to the fullest extent against you if you agree to forego your right to trial by jury." Um, that is very interesting because many in the legal profession say, oh, it's it'd be anarchy if jurors were allowed to use their discretion, but clearly we give that to prosecutors, and they, they basically have, have gone nuts with it and have become so abusive. Um, just to cite one horrifying, tragic example, um, the case of internet activist Aaron Schwartz, who... Um, essentially was prosecuted for something that none of the um, interested parties wanted him prosecuted for. Um, he, one of his main issues was uh, basically information being available to the general public and um, he had uh, set up a computer in a closet at MIT to automatically download large numbers of papers from an academic um, uh, document repository called JSTOR and with the intention of then releasing those to the public um, and I should add in here that a large number of these JSTOR documents only exist because they are paid for by the very taxpayers who are now not allowed to have that information. Uh, before he released any documents however um, the, the computer was found um, he ended up uh, coming to an agreement with JSTOR to return the data. They no longer had a complaint against him. MIT did not have a complaint against him. However, a um, U.S. attorney trying to make a name for herself ended up um, taking this as a chance to make an example of him. And she and another attorney 
uh, basically started hounding him, you have to do jail time. We're not going to give you a plea bargain without jail time. There's going to be a felony involved so that we can make an example of you. And since he was an internet activist, he felt like this is not acceptable for me. I won't be able to do my political work if I am, you know, branded a felon. I won't even be able to vote. And so he turned it down, and they just started stacking on more and more charges to try and crack him um, and get him to take the plea deal. Well, they did crack him, but not in that way. Um, he ended up taking his own life. And so that no one has been punished for that. Probably this person is is you know still on her way to making her career based on this kind of thing. It's disgusting. Um, so. That's one of the problems here is this prosecutorial power that's unchecked. When they offer a plea deal, they basically get it rubber stamped by a judge. The judge isn't there to say, hey, this isn't fair. Um, I'm not going to accept this. They basically say, well, whatever you guys worked out, I'll, I'll take and almost always will accept it. Um, another problem uh, related to that um, basically traced right back to this very thing that I just mentioned is uh, there's a phenomenon known as the trial tax. What that means is that if you take a plea bargain, you will get a punishment of, say, X years in prison. Um, and it's, maybe it's like two to five years. But for that exact same case, if you do not take the plea bargain and you go to a jury trial and lose, you will usually get far more punishment far more punishment than the prosecutor had just told you in the plea bargain offer was what they thought was actually fair for the offenses you committed. And so, say you get 10 or 20 more years because you exercised your right to trial by jury. And we see uh, memos sent, sentencing memos submitted by prosecutors saying, since this person exercised their right to trial by jury, that is an indicator that they are not remorseful and they need to be punished more. So what kind of right is it if you're essentially charged years and years of your life to exercise it? I mean, that is just appalling beyond belief. When a prosecutor offers a plea bargain, they're saying this is the amount of punishment we think is just for the offenses that you committed. You can be sure they're not saying, hey, Let's let some criminal who we could easily put away for a long time, let's let him off because we're, we're softies or something. That's ridiculous. They're saying that's what they believe is a fair punishment. And everything that that person sees on top of that plea bargain, that is a tax for exercising their right to trial by jury. And it's very intimidating. It can be absolutely life-destroying, and that is why... We've actually seen there's a, a federal judge who's actually published on this topic that people who are actually innocent are now being imprisoned because they're too scared to exercise their right to trial by jury because if they lose, they're going to suffer from this trial tax. tax. So I would say those are two of the big reasons that we've kind of gotten into this mess, that the prosecutors are basically an unchecked authority. They're often... Um, just basically running rampant to make their own careers. Uh, they, when they're trying to keep their job, i.e. in an election, they want to look tough on crime. And so they're just absolutely abusing this power and um, intimidating people out of their right to trial by jury. Well, the thing is, is that then you look at people who are getting in trouble and there's this almost blanket dismissal of them as, oh, they're criminals, they're bad people. But in fact, a lot of people that are in jail are genuinely innocent. And I mean, this is a terrifying conversation, I think, because mm -hmm. a lot of people think about, you know, the prison industrial complex. And I'm not really sure that this aspect of it, of just how unjust it is, it, like you can't avoid the prison. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, it's basically slavery um, because how yeah. are people supposed to, you know, there's so many different rules out there and even if you're not breaking them, they're just throwing you in jail and, and you don't even have any semblance of justice, but people are watching on TV, you know, Ally McBeal or Law and Order and there's all these big cases and there's all this stuff happening, but none of it is um, actually how the justice system works. Yeah, what? and I... 
I should mention, you, you said it's slavery, and it literally is. If you look at the 13th Amendment, which um, largely outlawed slavery in this country, it has a specific exception for punishment for a crime. You are allowed to enslave someone in this country as punishment for a crime, and we are actually literally doing that. Um, certain states have, as part of the punishment for felony, uh, hard labor is like it's not just you go to jail it's that you will be at hard labor for a certain amount of years uh, we see private prisons that are using prisoners as below market and below minimum wage uh, labor for pennies an hour often uh, and not just private prisons but um, private organizations will contract with uh, government prisons also for labor at these cheap below market rates um, and below minimum wage rates so regardless of what you think you know is is the appropriate way to set a wage it is below that <laughs> it's basically a company coming in and saying we want people to work for us for 17 cents an hour then the prison will often turn around and charge exorbitant rates for things like phone calls to families, um, or, or I shouldn't just say the prison, but the prison or their contractors um, for nece necessary uh, items from the commissary, such as personal hygiene items, uh, at far above market rates. Um, and I think some of the prisons are actually going to um, get rid of visitation and do like a video chat instead of in-person visitation, and they're going to be charging for that. So you're getting these slave wages that are, are just a joke, like 17 cents an hour, 28 cents an hour, and then you have to turn around and spend that just for the basic uh, needs of life in prison. I mean, this is just, it's just beyond ridiculous. It's absolutely disgusting. And um, honestly, I wish, you know, a lot of times we have jurors who they don't want to be there. I understand that. It's not convenient. You're not getting paid properly. You don't get to choose when you're there. You're often kept in the dark about critical information, such as jury nullification. I understand. It's not something most people want to do. But no matter how inconvenient it is for me sitting there, no matter how much I want to go home because it's the weekend or it's going to be a holiday or I'm missing work and I'm getting a little bit stressed because I'm getting behind at work or I don't, I don't know, you know if I'm going to be able to have a babysitter the next day, that's stressful and inconvenient. But you have to remember that the person who's sitting in that defendant seat they're not just being inconvenienced. Their life is at stake. If they go to jail, they're going to be at risk of losing custody of kids. They may have their marriage destroyed. Um, financially, they're already being devastated if they're even in court to begin with, just from the expense of that. But they're probably missing work, which means how are they going to pay for their housing? How are they going to make their car payment? They're probably losing you know, a lot of property. Um, if they're convicted, they're going to lose all kinds of future opportunities for employment or education. Uh, it's, it's drastically more difficult to get a job when you have a conviction on your record. And beyond that, then you, you, think, you have to think of the physical risks of prison. They're at risk of being assaulted. They're at risk of being sexually abused by other prisoners or more likely prison officials. And we have actually seen people who have spent as little as one day in jail and it became a de facto death sentence uh, because they had a medical condition that was ignored, such as they weren't given insulin for diabetes, um, or that they had a severe food allergy that was ignored and when they, they had their reaction, they were, you know, the guard said, oh, you're faking it and didn't pr provide them with attention. So, you know, people who are there for as little as, oh, you didn't show up in court, we're putting you in jail and contempt of court, someone like that can essentially have a death sentence. So, you know, as much as we want to get out of there, um, we want to uh, just hurry up and get a verdict done so that we can go home, I think it's very important that we all realize if we were the ones sitting in that person's seat, if we were the one whose life was on the line, we would not appreciate it if you know, the jurors who, were, who, who literally had our life in their hands were treating it casually so that they could go watch a football game or something. 
I mean, I don't mean to be silent, but it's just so stunning. Um, as somebody who has uh, learned more about the prison industrial complex, it never ceases to amaze me how unbelievably unjust the entire thing is top to bottom. What do you think about, um, what, do you know much about the appeals process and the expense of that and the likelihood of appeals uh, to go through? Because people say, oh, well, you can appeal a bad decision. What does that look like? Yeah, so already you've been financially devastated by the first round. So now you're going to have a much harder time uh, being able to afford round two. Beyond that, you are now presumed guilty instead of being presumed innocent. So now, instead of doing nothing to prove your innocence and having the other side have to prove your guilt, now you have to prove your innocence, which is far harder to do. Uh, you also have a limited number of reasons for which you can appeal. It's not just, I lost and I didn't like that and I wanted a redo. You have to show that there's new evidence that wasn't available at the time or that there was some inappropriate ruling made by the judge or that there was some inappropriate behavior that went on in the courtroom or something to that effect. And that is largely other judges to decide. So who do they work for? It's not, it's not that people often think, oh, the judge is the neutral third party in there and the, the attorneys are the two, two sides with a dog in the fight. But in fact, a lot of judges, maybe most, are former prosecutors and they get paid by the government. And they make their living having courtrooms filled with people. So they are not neutral parties. <laughs> don't, don't ever think that. <laughs> Um, so it's much harder to do, and not surprisingly, the odds of winning an appeal are much lower. Um, it's it's very disturbing. Um, I know people think that it's it's basically the same, just a redo of the first first round, but it's not. It's much harder for the defendant, um, and and oftentimes people can't even afford to to go that route to begin with. Why are people not? throwing things with fury at this situation. I mean, okay, I'm a regular citizen. I'm taking the in initiative to learn about this. You're taking the initiative to educate people about this. But why aren't attorneys who presumably went into justice in order to serve it, not to complete... I mean, we're talking about 98% of the, the attorneys in this country being complicit and people working in the justice industry and allowing this to go on. Why is this still... Um, and happening in such a, I mean, it's, it's horrifying. There's no, not strong enough a word to describe that. Yeah. Well, there are all kinds of incentives, and the, um, the sort of idealistic incentive of wanting to do justice is just one of them. Uh, there are also economic incentives where people want to earn a lot of money and have a certain standard of living. There are also social incentives where people want to be looked at in their community in a certain way. There are political incentives where people want to gain power over other people so that they can get them to do their bidding. And often <laughs> these other incentives will end up overruling um, the the idealistic and, you know, admirable, but often less, uh, uh, less persistent uh, incentive of, of the feeling of having done justice. There are some great attorneys out there, um, and I definitely would love to see them all come to my website and sign up for our volunteer attorney network, <laughs> but there are also a lot of, a lot of attorneys who um, are there for other reasons than doing justice. Um, oftentimes, people will also mistake the idea of upholding the law for delivering justice. Um, I would like to reframe that idea. <laughs> um, the law is there for the purpose of upholding justice, but sometimes the law and justice are in conflict. And when they are in conflict, the appropriate thing to do is set aside the law so that justice can prevail. Um, what often mistakenly happens and what people are often um, tragically told and convinced of is that the law is what's supreme, that sometimes we have to have injustice in order to uphold the law, or there will be anarchy, we'll never have, you know, we'll, we'll have chaos everywhere, everyone will do their own thing, people will do whatever they want. 
Well, we have had jury nullification for literally centuries. It predates the Magna Carta, which um, we just passed a recent 800th anniversary of Magna Carta in 2015. Jury nullification predates that. And if we have had this discretion always available for 800 years for jurors to refuse to enforce the law when the law is unjust, and we haven't managed to devolve into anarchy yet, I think it's time to kill that one for good. That is just the most ridiculous argument I can think of, uh, really, at this point. So, um, so I have a couple. Uh, I mean, gosh, I could talk about this all day. Um, it's really, really wild. By the way, are you allowed to use the law to make examples of people? Has that not been challenged as a concept? I mean, are people not supposed to be examples? So. Supposed to and what happens are two different issues. You are not supposed to do that. Um, in fact, uh, Eric Holder, I think, but right before he resigned as Attorney General, basically sent a memo to all the U.S. attorneys admonishing them that they were not supposed to be stacking on charges for the purpose of getting people to crack under plea bargains. Did that have any teeth? No. I mean, they're, they're obviously not supposed to do it, but what's going to happen? Who's going to prosecute them? Are prosecutors going to prosecute themselves? I mean, is it even officially illegal, or is that just policy? Um, basically, they're unchecked in that way. Um, so, yeah, they shouldn't be doing it. They're not supposed to do it. They are doing it. How can people... Um support your efforts and like what can people do because this is obviously terrifying depressing awful what can be besides educate other I mean I, I would think that the first thing and the most important thing is bringing this to more people's attention are there other groups that you guys have partnered with that you encourage people to check out in addition to your site which if you could plug that please yeah um, we are at FIJA.org, just our initials, FIJA.org. Um, and we have a number of other organizations who, when they're doing a campaign, will give uh, information to. Uh, right now, Occupy Denver uh, at the Lindsay Flanagan Courthouse in Denver has a campaign going. Um, I just sent information to a group of people doing outreach in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, and then also, um, Oh, and also, there are a number of people in New Hampshire, I should also mention. Um, I think possibly all now of the county courthouses are being covered. Um, if not, they were up to all but one when I last checked. But, um, yeah, what I try to encourage people to do is, if you are the only one who knows about this, if you're the defense, you're the only one who is for sure never going to be on your jury. So it doesn't behoove us to keep this information to ourselves. So I would like everyone to start by educating their own jury. Go find 12 people who you bring this information to and convince them of it. Um, and then hopefully you will ask them to also create their own jury. Um, if, we each, if we each spent time just to create our own jury and each of those people did it, we would have the whole country covered in a very short time. Um, but yeah. Uh, come see us at FIJA.org. Um, there's an activism tab for how you can uh, get involved. There are links on the home page to all of our social media. And um, also, we are very grateful for any donations anyone can make. Uh, our annual budget is less than the salary of, a, of one attorney for a year. <laughs> so uh, any donations are tax deductible, and we're very grateful for those. Um, right now, I'm working on developing some online classes to just train people in the general concepts of jury rights and also um, an advanced master class uh, for people like attorneys, our big activists, um, people who are more interested, um, and then also a speaker class so that we can get a network of speakers out there um, covering all these different communities in person. Okay, this is great. You know, um, I would recommend that you check out, I did an interview a couple weeks ago with Pamela Morgan, and I know that you're not as familiar with um, legal uses for blockchain technology, but Pam is really, really great with that stuff. She's also a lovely person, a good friend. Um, and what she was talking about was an open source law firm 
and um, sort of doing different kinds of things where they're providing documentation and uh, using the blockchain. So maybe we could have you back um, in a few months and, and maybe even Pam at the same time and we could talk a little bit more about technological solutions because, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I love the idea of telling 12 people, making your own jewelry. I, I'd like to actually think on that a little bit later on down the line. Um, but I think that the more solutions that we could come up with that rely yeah. less on centralized sources of mm -hmm. power that clearly have so many incentives for corruption, uh, the better. Mm -hmm. so thank you so right. much for, uh, for coming on the show. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? Any upcoming uh, speaking engagements? Are you coming to Freedom Fest in uh, July? <laughs> I am. Oh, I think that is that the, the one in Orlando? No, Orlando is um, the National Libertarian Party Convention. Oh, um, okay. Freedom Fest is in um, is in Las Vegas, July thirteenth no. to the seventeenth. No, I don't. I don't have anyone that I know of going to that. But um, we do have Dr. Roger Roots, who will be at the National Libertarian Convention speaking on jury nullification. And um, just to plug someone else's event. Um, uh, there is a, an event in Rochester Hills, Michigan <laughs> on June 11th that I wish I could go to. Um, the attorney, uh, David Coleman, attorney for Keith Wood, who is right now uh, fighting illegal charges against him for handing out our literature at a courthouse, he will be there speaking on jury nullification. Um, and that is on Fiji's Facebook page, facebook.com slash national. So I think I just shared that earlier today, or if not, I'll share it later today. But um, those are two upcoming events, um, if people happen to be in those areas. And um, uh, the next thing kind of on my radar is Jury Rights Day, which is not till September 5th. <laughs> Okay. Well, listen, uh, Pam will actually maybe able to go to that Michigan one, so I'll be sure to connect you. Thank you again for being on the okay. show. Um, just uh, have a good day. And um, before we move on to, to bringing on Laura, everyone, um, of course, I'm very passionate about the Ross case, and I wanted to remind everybody to please go and check out freeross.org and make a donation. In lieu of me having an actual advertiser, I'm advertising for the Albrecht family today. Um, all right, thanks so much, Kirsten. I'll speak with you soon. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, great. So now we're going to be bringing up Laura. Laura, you're looking dark for some reason, and here you are. The light has come upon you. That was a really heavy segment, don't you think so? Oh, I can't hear you. We're looking for the mute button, ladies and gentlemen. Modern technology leaves us in the lurch once again. Okay. Can you there she is. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah. that's some mind-blowing stuff, right? Yeah, it's pretty intense. Actually, um, while you guys were having that conversation, I was just not you know, those articles. The audio is a little messy. I don't know. Maybe you're um, not close enough to the microphone. Oh, now it's going to be better. Or maybe you had something over the mic. Okay. Is this better? Yes, better. Um, but when you guys were, were talking, I was looking up, you know that those news stories that came out uh, a few weeks ago about the FBI faking like forensic hair evidence for decades? You know, yeah, that, I didn't see that article. It sounds horrifying. Yeah, it is, it is really bad. You know, essentially they, you know, faked an entire field of forensic science and it's been going on for 20, 20 years now. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's bad. It's it's really bad. And it's like, you know, I mean, to an extent I understand why the legal system exists, but you know, when the government is caught doing stuff like that, it's it's scary because, you know, we want to go through life, you know, we tell ourselves that we're free, you know, but really the system is uh, stacked against us in, in a lot of ways. Not, you know, to inherit like some mantle of victimhood or anything like that, but but yeah, it's um it's scary. You know, if you get in trouble um and you don't have a lot of money, you're you're kinda screwed, you know? It sucks. And it's not it's not fair, you know. Oh no. Well the thing is is that, you know, I'm I'm friends with the Ulbrich family and, and Ross is very lucky because his mom is always going around as his advocate and and luckily for me I've 
learn from this what this really means. You know, you think about the justice system, you don't really pay attention until something happens that really relates to you and it really changes you. But then think about all those poor people, a lot of the minorities, um, that, that have no one to champion their cause. They basically are rotting in these holes, being abused, being paid 20 cents an hour, um, and then having to buy, you know, soap for five bucks or whatever. I mean, it's, it's really, really appalling. Yeah, um, it is, it is bad. And the whole private prison thing, you know, I'm not, I'm not like seriously educated on this topic, so what am I? That's okay, we're there? just chatting. And yeah. not all of our listeners are so familiar with it, so I, I yeah. hope they're learning something. Yeah, but the private prison thing is terrifying, because once you start turning imprisoning people into a for-profit enterprise, that's when, like, things really start to hit the fan in the long term, you know? Yeah, you know, I actually have thought a lot about that because um, I know that you're not libertarian, maybe one, one or two issues, but for the most part you're not. So, But for us, like, we always say, oh, private is better. But when you talk about private prisons, it's like there's really only one customer, so the market doesn't really work effectively. And there's a really great talk, uh, hopefully we can put this link at the bottom at the end that Bob Murphy does where he analyzes what would real private prisons look like where prisoners would actually get a choice of where they go and the money that they work for and the skills that they develop can be used to pay back the people from which they took something from. Obviously if you murder somebody no amount of money can ever repay them but you can make sure that that person's family doesn't suffer financially um, and it's just you know, also, there's not that abuse incentive, right? If you own a prison and your prisoner can pick another prison, you're not going to treat them terribly either. I mean, I'm not looking for Club Med, but we need it to be... Um, look at Germany. You should. I don't know if you've ever seen the German prisons, but they have a very low recidivis, recidivism, yeah. uh, which means returning back because they're treated humanely and they're rehabilitated. They're yeah. allowed to spend time with their families, and it seems to be more effective. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and a little bit of a culture of compassion could be injected into our society for sure because everybody's so judgmental. I mean, anybody I know has done broken the law a million times. We're just lucky that we're not getting in trouble for it. It could happen to somebody, wrong day, wrong time, wrong street, and you're going to be in jail forever. It's um, true, actually. A lot of yeah. people you know, walk around through life and they, they forget about the lock portion, you know, that suddenly things fall from the sky, you know, and you can have like this whole plan, like have it all laid out, and just stuff happens, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it, and um, I think it'll be something that I really infuse into when I do my next album because I have the Silk Road song on there. It's going to be something that I would like to use to to force the issue a little bit because it's it's really something that needs to be paid attention to. I mean, the pile of terrible things happening right now, but this is a, I think a core example of how, how sick a society is, is the way that they yeah. treat their criminals. I mean, you can't just, yeah. whatever, suspend justice. Right. Um, but let's talk a little bit about possible solutions with Bitcoin and how you have used Bitcoin. We were introduced by Valerian from Pop Chest, I think. Yeah. Uh, we, we did a music uh, and entertainment industry panel in Los Angeles about a year ago. And you've done a lot of cool stuff with Bitcoin in order to bring it to the masses in a palpable way. So why don't you give me a little background and we can go from there. Yeah, well, the way I start out was first I taught an introductory, like a free introductory Bitcoin class, like at a local hackerspace in Los Angeles. And um, I was actually pretty surprised by the turnout that I got. It was actually it was actually pretty good um, and I invested a fairly decent amount of time into distilling within an hour for average people what Bitcoin is, why it works as well as it does and why it's important and um, you know people that showed up really responded to it. Um, it was it was really awesome and I think, I mean my, my best guess right now, you know a lot of us that are into Bitcoin keep waiting. You know, we've been waiting for years now for like this mainstream moment thing to happen. And it hasn't it hasn't happened yet. Like we're still we're still not there. It reminds me a lot of, you know, email in like 1996 or 1997 where people were like still figuring out where like the at symbol was on their keyboard. They were like, oh, 
oh, I use that, oh, okay, email, sort of, I get it, you know, I think it's kind of, it's a pretty similar thing um, with the exception that Bitcoin is more complicated, it's, an, it's a very complicated technology, but it, it's only as complicated as you make it, like, you can abstract away, like, a lot of the complication and, like, the math underneath, and that's, um, that's what I do my best to do. Um, and my other sort of thing that I do, um, after that I moved on because um, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for a way to supplement um, my sort of income stream uh, using the skill set I currently have, which is uh, editing reality television. I've been um, editing reality TV in Los Angeles for a few years now. And um, I'm sort of, I wanted to start making my own video content, too. And uh, I would like Bitcoin to be a part of that. I, I do make videos. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I have my own uh, small Bitcoin micropayment site. And uh, I do make some Bitcoin-related content. Um, I also make certain, uh, a certain amount of cat-related content. <laughs> but, uh, but it's not all Bitcoin and cats. Um, general interest stuff, like I went to uh, a place in Oakland and checked out sort of a collection of people sort of working on um, livable, sort of sustainable housing and shipping containers, which was really cool and really interesting. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so essentially what I'm trying to do right now is I'm not giving, like I would give the class um, if there was, and there seems to be like a certain amount of demand for it. Um, I've been taking a little hiatus from the class while I work on building my, my media company. But if, you know, people want me to have a class in LA or San Francisco, again, I'd be, I'd be happy, happy to do my Bitcoin 101 thing again. But how did you hear about it originally? You know, uh, it's so it's kind of random. Like I was just on Reddit in like 2011, and I was just poking around on Reddit. Um, I've been reading Reddit. I love Reddit. Read a lot of Reddit, and I just found it. You know, I just found the white paper somewhere. You know, on the internet, and I didn't really understand most of it because I don't have an advanced degree in, in computer science or math or anything. But you know, like a whole the whole peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system thing, you know, if it works, you know, it's a, it's a truly revolutionary technology. And I wouldn't consider myself, like, I'm a little political. I'm not the most politi political person. I'm a, little, I'm a little political, though. And, like, when you start talking about Bitcoin, it almost inherently becomes a political conversation because it's money. And the only definition that we have for money is that a nation state creates it. And through our own labor, we're able to, you know, pr provide income for ourselves that we're able to eat. And that's basically how modern life in most developed societies work. So when you change, you know, the fundamental aspect of who's creating the money and who's, you know, spreading it around and making it and distributing it, it really changes the way the world works. Um, I, think it, I think it will. You know, things like this take time. Uh, it's hard to predict what's gonna what's gonna happen, um, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, did you know about the Federal Reserve when you read about um, Bitcoin? A little bit, you know. I still um, not when I read about it. You know, as time has gone by, and I attempt to explain um, things to people a little bit. Um, I did I did learn some more. Um, I wouldn't call myself an economist or an expert, but you know the whole. People thought, you know, uh, against the creation of a central bank in the United States for a number of years. Actually, I think the Federal Reserve has only existed since 1913. I'm, I'd have to like that's look it up you on, did it on <laughs> Wikipedia. But you know, the reason the Federal Reserve was created, I'm just hopefully, you know, I, I would have to verify a lot of this, but I believe it was in response to a financial crisis, like in the uh, early. Um, early 20th century. And it's like, you know, um, this country existed for a long period of time um, without it. And so now, now we have this. Um, and one of the first things, uh, one of the first things about sort of 
thinking about money in general, and this is one of the first questions that people have about Bitcoin is, well, what backs it up? You know, how do we know that it has value? You know, how can we trust it? And, you know, I do my, I go over it very, very quickly because I'm trying to get everything done in an hour, but for the most part, you know, the only reason the dollar has any value is just because the government said so. That's it. You know, that's it. There's nothing else backing up the U.S. dollar anymore other than, you know, the supposed faith and credit of the United States government. And if you look at, you know, financially, like our balance sheets and our liabilities in terms of Social Security and social spending, and, you know, we're deeply, like, in the red, you know, long term. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's pretty, I mean, a, we live in sort of a world that's, you know, that s somehow sustains itself on debt-based money, but, and it keeps going, you know, like the train keeps progressing, like it keeps moving, but it seems to me at, at some point, you know, debt-based financial systems eventually fail. Yeah, I mean, there has to be the pipe. The, the pipe is going to have to pay the whatever, you know. It's going to have to end at some point. Um, do you think that uh, that issue resonates with, I guess, um, the understanding of monetary policy? Do you think that that's something that people on the left may have opposition to versus a libertarian who's a little bit more savvy about um, the impact of the banking system? Is that something that people... I don't know why I've made you the official representative of the left, but maybe because you're from California. <laughs> but do you think that, uh, like, let's say, like a Bernie supporter, do you think that they realize uh, the problems with the Federal Reserve System uh, on an actual, you know, beyond saying banks are bad or something? Probably not. Um, most people are not educated on the stuff at all. And, you know, it's also important to just kind of, like, think back, because a lot of what we think we know about the government was taught to us when we were children, and most of us, a lot of us, I didn't go to public schools as a kid, but a lot of a lot of people do. So, you know, you have, you know, starting with, like, the education of children, you know, and what we tell them about the way that the world works, you know, um, there isn't, at least I don't remember a lot of time being spent when I was on, in high school, you know, like, understanding sort of the economic underpinnings of our current financial system. And, you know, not that it's an intentional thing, but in a way it behooves, you know, people who do have a lot of money to not have people really understand sort of, like, how all of this works. You know, not to say it's, like, some kind of conspiracy, because I don't, I don't really, I don't think it is, you know. But um, as far as uh, people just don't, um, as far as people's ability to understand, like, they're just, they're not educated, and they're also, many of them are not interested, because for the most part, things are moving fine. The only thing, you know, the only concern they really have about money in general is that they would like more of it. That's it, you know? And then, that's about, that's about all of the brain power that many people would like to, to designate to that sort of thing, but that tends to change um, really quickly when, you know, you're confronted with some kind of personal crisis, you know, in terms of, like, money. Like, you know how we, we were talking about uh, the justice system earlier? Something I, I mentioned it only once in my class, but civil asset forfeiture is, like, a, a huge and growing problem, and it's getting, it's getting really, really bad, you know? And sort of the thing about all this cryptocurrency stuff is it allows you to control your money, you know, and the flip side of being able to control your money completely is that you have to take some responsibility for it, you know, you have to have, you have to write down your passwords, you have to back them up, you have to communicate to people, you know, how to access, you know, your, your bitcoins, you know, when you, if, if you die, you know, that kind of thing, you know, you, you have to take some responsibility for all that, but, you know, then you're able to, to control it. Um, Although I think it's definitely possible within the next few years they're going to enact laws that um, force you to give up passwords for encrypted devices, things like that. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of, you know, encryption, privacy, um, personal security, and being able to independently manage your finances because most people don't realize how much control they've given up when they have their money resting in financial institutions. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking a little bit back to my question. 
Um, to me, when, when I was younger, I was always sort of searching. You know, I, I could see the problems and I thought I was coming up with solutions. But it wasn't until um, my revelation with the Federal Reserve that all of a sudden all of these things became uh, more clearly defined as what was the what was wrong, and you know there's also the the question of incentives, and that's really playing out. So even when you don't think, for example, when you talk about a populace that isn't educated, um, there's an incentive for that structure to exist. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. People respond to incentives. Um, and gosh, we're we're in a big, big pickle now. But I think that we have a really good opportunity with what's happening right now politically because people will become less dependent on only politics being the the way out, right? So everybody thinks, you know, the other day I said something against Bernie, and then everybody flips out, and then they automatically think that I'm going for Trump. I'm like, no, I don't like Trump either. I don't like Hillary. I don't like any of these people. Mm -hmm. And to me, I genuinely mean I'm not interested in voting. I mean, maybe I'll vote libertarian, but I don't think that that has value. To me, Bitcoin has been much more fulfilling as a source of activism and change and also what I like about it is, yeah, you know, obviously I'm libertarian, but I don't need to necessarily even get into all that. If you empower 2 billion people to have a bank account, it doesn't matter if you're liberal or a righty or a neocon or freaking a Muslim extremist, you're allowing people to empower themselves, make their own decisions, and to hopefully dig themselves out of um, economic destitution. Um, so, I don't know, good stuff today. Yeah, in the world, I like it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy, you know. It's good to keep abreast of all these things. Well, I I'm, I think it's an exciting time. So, where can people listen to you? Where can people find out more about what you're working on? We, if you decide to bring back the classes. Yeah. Um. So I have a website, um, BitcoinClasses.com. Um, you can sign up for my mailing list, mailing list there. Um, if you're interested in any more classes. Um. Just let me know. Send me a message. I have a little message box on the website too. As far as like watching my video content, um, if anybody is interested, um, I have a YouTube channel. So my my Twitter handle is uh, at suchwow TV, and uh, my Twitter profile will show my YouTube channel link. And I also have a micropayment website at uh, suchwow TV. If you would at all be interested in passing me twenty five cents worth of Bitcoin for one of my videos. Very cool. Um, this is good stuff. So, uh, by the way, so on uh, we air on multiple uh, stations. Uh, we're broadcasting from Liberty.me, but then it goes to Let's Talk Bitcoin and IPM Nation and Free Talk Live, um, or no, LRN.FM, which is where Free Talk Live is. Anyway, um, but we have a magic word or a magic phrase that we usually use for Let's Talk Bitcoin. What do you think we should make it? A magic, a magic word. What do you mean exactly, like magic word? <laughs> Everybody think, I'm like, it's going to turn you into a toad when you're done. No, there's no, there's no magic about it. Um, so let's talk Bitcoin in order to incentivize people when they're listening to um, get prizes. You, you say the magic word and it shows you're a bigger listener at the LTV network. So that's why. But I like to make it something a little bit related to the show or a general message that I want to impart to people. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Let's do jury nullification. <laughs> like really straight, you know, but but it's a central thing, you know. Everybody go out and look up our magic word <laughs> words uh jury nullification. <laughs> it could potentially work. All right, good. Yeah. All right, so thanks very much for coming on. Um thank you, Kirsten, for coming on as well. We will see you guys next week. Thanks to the people watching. Take care. Good job. Bye. Thanks. Bye.